Every watershed starts with a drop. It starts with trickles in the headwaters that merge into streams and into rivers that ultimately flow out to sea. It's a single connected system. A healthy watershed provides us with clean water that promotes biodiversity. It's the rearing habitat for endangered salmon species. It supports our fisheries, offers recreation, and it nurtures our forests. We reap these benefits every time we drink water from our faucets. We need to foster the idea of connectivity. Consider the connection between salmon and forests. After years at sea, salmon return to their natal stream to reproduce and ultimately die. The bodies of the salmon fertilize the forest with marine nutrients. The burgeoning forest in turn sustains a healthy stream for future generations of salmon. You cannot simply extract trees from the equation and still expect salmon to thrive. Everything is connected. You cannot protect a watershed without also protecting its constituent streams. Protecting small streams is essential to protecting the ecological integrity of watersheds and the marine environments they feed. Before the mid-70s, there weren't many rules in place to protect streams from logging throughout the Northwest. There was a lot of clear cuts that ran roughshod over streams. Uh, around the mid-70s, uh, it became apparent that streams needed protection from forest practices or logging. And that's when this water typing classification system was developed by the State Department of Natural Resources. This system assigned values or codes to stream reaches and depending on that code, that drove how much of a buffer, how much protection that stream reach would receive from adjacent logging or forest practices. Within a given watershed, you have many, many tributary streams. The basic idea of water typing is this. If a section of stream has any species of fish or meets the state's definition of fish habitat, it's labeled F. If a section of stream does not have fish, it's labeled N. Streams are divided into reaches or sections such that one reach might be coded F and another reach on the same stream coded N. F-type streams receive a buffer and N-type streams receive little to no buffer. Logging and development are prohibited within these buffers, so in theory, important fish habitat is both identified and protected. The execution of this plan, however, is a different story. There was uh, a request by the state to have these maps put together um, that would identify where on all of these tributaries, I mean, thousands and thousands of miles of water bodies, where is it that there are fish and where aren't they? Pause a moment to consider the task at hand. Not only did the state want a map of every stream, lake, and wetland, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of miles of water bodies, but they also wanted just a handful of individuals to identify which stream reaches were fish bearing and which were not. And what they did was look at maps. They did very little on the ground. And from looking at the topography and what they could take off of the map, they would assign these values. You know, I think fish got to here, or I, I think this is uh, this value of wetland. All of a sudden, that information just became part of what we used as uh, guiding the protections of these water bodies. Versions of these same maps remain on the website of the Department of Natural Resources or DNR. In 2005, the state spent considerable time and money revising them, but their foundation remained unchanged. They're still used by state and local governments, by landowners and developers to view various parcels of land to determine where the buffers are located. I have great sympathy for the task, and I have great sympathy for the individuals that were asked to do that. Um, unfortunately, when you actually go out in the field and actually see how accurate those maps turned out to be, they were in great error as one would expect. Regulatory water type maps that are used by state and local governments to identify and protect critical areas including streams and wetlands are extremely inaccurate. Uh, in our experience, they're wrong 50 to 70 percent of the time. 
the types of inaccuracies that we're seeing, the discrepancies between what we find on the ground and on the maps, fall into three main categories. The first of which is streams that we find on the ground that are not on these regulatory water type maps at all. Coho salmon fry that just had hatched out of its egg about two months ago. We're here sitting on the banks of an unmapped stream, unmapped, unclassified, doesn't exist as far as the regulatory agencies are concerned. And a uh, big part of what we're trying to do is get these streams on the map so that they can benefit from the protection that they warrant under existing regulations. The second type of discrepancy that we find between the real world and the regulatory water type maps is when the maps show the stream in the wrong location. The maps are so inaccurate, I'm standing here where the stream really is, and Frank is standing where DNR has the stream mapped. The third type of discrepancy is when the classification of the stream is inaccurate. All right, running right through the middle of a golf course, non-fish bearing on the DNR maps, uh, yet we found three species of fish within a couple hundred feet of this location. This stream meanders through this wetland and comes here, and there's a confluence of a small spring upwelling that was typed N. But you can go up that whole segment of stream here and catch fish throughout. I caught mud minnows, and here I just saw some salmonids, but I was able to catch a small stickleback here too. Great. Uh, we surveyed watersheds from the Canadian border down to the Columbia and found that on average uh, about 50 to 70 percent of the regulatory maps were inaccurate. Uh, so this problem that we've identified is not isolated to any one particular region of Washington state. It seems to be fairly consistent throughout. For example, we're water typing now on the Kitsap Peninsula west of Seattle and we're finding uh, in one particular watershed, as an example, that the regulatory map missed two-thirds, or 66 percent, of this watershed. I spent a few days in the field with Wild Fish Conservancy while they were ground-truthing streams. That means surveying the stream, documenting any fish they find, and correcting the errors in the regulatory map. Most of the streams they surveyed were incorrectly mapped, if mapped at all, and it underscored the point that the state does not have a reliable inventory of the very habitat it aims to protect. I got a couple of coho. Ambitious regulation is therefore ineffective. This point was made particularly clear in a recent National Marine Fisheries Service report. Wild Fish Conservancy isn't the only organization with concerns about habitat protection. Uh, the Treaty Tribes of Western Washington recently released a report where they're very concerned about how habitat protection is taking place in, in the Puget Sound region. DNR acknowledges that the maps are inaccurate. Uh, they require that they not be taken at face value. Uh, unfortunately, that message is lost uh, among some local governments and state governments that are using the maps. Local governments are the ones who make land use decisions in Washington. So that means around Puget Sound there's over a hundred separate jurisdictions that are required to, to make the decisions and are also setting up the buffers. Uh, the biggest problem is that there's no requirement by the state for the local governments to actually inventory their habitat before they make the land use decisions. So if they rely on the, on the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources maps of uh, stream habitat, well we know that those maps aren't 100% reliable. They could be making land use decisions without even knowing that a stream actually exists. We water typed a property on the Kitsap Peninsula, uh, a particular landowner who had purchased a, a wooded property uh, with the intention of developing it. The DNR map showed one fish bearing stream that ran through the property. When we did the survey, we found that that stream was mismapped. It was in the wrong location on his property. And in fact, we found a second stream that DNR had not mapped at all uh, that was also fish bearing. But when you get into a situation like where we were, when we started, we had 50-foot boundaries or setbacks, and now they changed them up to 150-foot, you know. It just don't work, Kevin. It just doesn't work. It just don't justify it. Well, like I stated, 150 feet, it's 60 feet to the top of the 
top of the bank. Would be clear over into the wetlands by the time we got done with a 150 foot setback. And, That's and, just on this side, and when you measure it, it's got to be from the edge of the creek. And so it's another 150 feet that way. And, and what and what was this on the maps? What did it say on the map? Uh, it wasn't even located here. On the maps that DNR's got and the county's got, the creek was located way over that way. There are two potential outcomes here. Either this landowner has invested a lot of time and money developing a plan that he can't implement, or he ultimately is granted a variance by the local government and is allowed to cut down these buffers and the stream loses. It's uh, really a lose-lose. Somebody's going to lose in this situation. If the maps are correct to start with, everybody makes their plans on, on a solid foundation and there's not, it's not a contentious issue anymore. Again, we're not interested in pointing fingers or assigning blame. We're interested in fixing a problem that's very fixable. The problem is that the regulatory maps that are being used are inaccurate, and the reason they're inaccurate is because they were based on a very coarse digital elevation model. Uh, there are tools that are available now, including LIDAR, or Light Detection and Ranging, which allow us to develop a much higher resolution digital elevation model, which will do a much better job of predicting where streams and fish habitats are. This is an example of the current DNR regulatory map. There's very little topographic detail, and it's almost impossible to project where the stream channels are located. Accordingly, this is the extent of Snyder Creek in South Puget Sound. A LIDAR map of the same landscape tells quite a different story. A quick glance reveals a clear channel as well as tributary streams. Again, here's the current regulatory map and here's the LIDAR. The qualitative difference is huge. Ground truthing by Wild Fish Conservancy shows the actual extent of Snyder Creek's watershed. This represents a 300% increase in fish bearing stream miles. Streams that have always warranted a buffer, but have been marginalized because of dated mapping technology. Aldo Leopold said that the first rule of intelligent tinkering is that you keep all the parts. Uh, we, we are not going to be able to restore our way back to healthy watersheds. We're going to have to protect the habitat that we have. And it's always cheaper in the long run to protect what you have than to break it and go back and try to fix it. So in order to protect the healthy watersheds we do have, we need an accurate inventory and the current regulatory maps are simply too unreliable. So Wild Fish Conservancy is uh, seeking funding to develop a better model. We're going to use LIDAR data instead of the coarse digital elevation model that was originally used to better predict where streams and fish habitats are. In, in the meantime, we have two prescriptions that we think would be most effective. The first is for local governments and state governments that use regulatory maps not to take them at face value. And the second is to ground truth those maps uh, to get accurate information about where critical areas, where streams and wetlands are on these properties. The good news is that LIDAR data already exist for much of Washington, with more available each year. So this is the most efficient way to fix the broken system. By creating these new regulatory maps, we clarify where our critical areas are located. We end the uncertainty and frustration of landowners and developers. We enable state and local governments to make informed land use decisions, and we ensure the protection of our healthy watersheds.